Um, so on behalf of uh, Glasgow Caledonia University and IGD Scotland, I would like to welcome you to this um, very special event. Um, this man doesn't need an introduction, but I will give him one anyway. Um, with a career that spans over two decades, uh, Richard is a game designer, a writer, a public speaker, an educator, and a consultant. Um, he is most famously known for his work on the critically acclaimed Uncharted series, uh, where he was lead and co-lead design on. <clears throat> uh, Richard is a passionate advocate for independent and experimental games. Um, he has been involved in the Independent Games Festival in the game since 2009. Uh, he is also a faculty member of the GDC Experimental Session and uh, also organises the extremely popular GDC Microtalks. So in 2012, uh, Richard became uh, the visiting associate professor, uh, where he is now <coughs> associate professor, if I'm not mistaken, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the interactive media division of the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California. Um, in this evening's masterclass, Richard will talk about his transition from AAA console game designer to um, a game design professor and the challenges he faced in learning how to teach the dark art um, of game design. <laughs> Uh, he's a good friend of mine and I'm extremely grateful that he's taken the time to be here this evening. So could you please extend a warm welcome to Richard Martin. Thank you very much guys. Thanks for such a, uh, a warm welcome. Um, and thanks for that lovely introduction. I love video games. I love AAA games, I love indie games, and perhaps most of all, I love art games. I love the spectacle and the production values of AAA games, and I love to be right in the middle of a computer graphics scene, interacting in real time with visuals that even just a few years ago, uh, a single frame of which uh, would have taken us minutes, maybe even hours to render. I love being in the midst of an adaptive musical score and a, a complex interactive audio scenario. And I love control schemes that have been so skillfully designed that they melt away from my conscious attention, freeing me to act in the game with grace and with ease. And I love the innovation and the spirit of indie games. I love the ways in which an indie game developer can make a game every bit as compelling as a, a blockbuster game by focusing on gameplay and mechanics over expensive production values. And I really love how the world of indie games has made it possible for designers from many different backgrounds to make games, improving the diversity of both the game development community and its audience of players. And I love art games uh, because they show the way for everyone by discovering new ways that designers can express complex ideas about what it means to be human through the spaces of possibility in the systems of the games that they create. I love art games that make it possible for players to explore these spaces of possibility and to express themselves through play, where players become a part of the unfolding artwork themselves as they bring it to life. And I love art games for showing us that everything in the world is an appropriate subject to make a video game about. Well, good evening folks. My name is Richard Lamarchand and it's really good to be with you here today. Uh, as Romana said, I'm a game designer, a producer, uh, and now an educator, among other things. Uh, here are some of the games I've worked on. Uh, hopefully you'll recognize a couple of them. Um, and I'm originally from England, but uh, I've lived in California since 1995. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to, as Romana said, have worked as uh, a lead game designer, a co-lead game designer at Naughty Dog for um, eight of the past nine years, uh, where I helped to create all three games in the Uncharted series. And with the Uncharted games, we worked really hard to create cinematic video game experiences that have the same high quality of writing, performance, characterization and storytelling as all of our favorite movies, but that keep you, the player, in the middle of the action from moment to moment, nearly all of the time. Well, we were really happy, uh, of course, with the warm reception that the Uncharted games received, uh, and their success has provided the foundation for what's now become a really important story world for Naughty Dog's parent company, uh, Sony. 
And I'm sure that you guys are as excited as I am to play Naughty Dog's uh, new game, uh, The Last of Us. I'm sure many of you have already finished this game, in fact. I've got my copy uh, sitting at home waiting for me. Um, I can tell, as, as can we all, from the very warm critical reception that this game's received, that it's turned out to be every bit as special as you'd expect a Naughty Dog game to be. So, um, about a year ago, I made this huge career change when, after all of these incredibly uh, rewarding years at Naughty Dog, I left the studio. And after traveling around the world over the summer, these are just a few of my, uh, my snapshots, uh, I checked in at 14 different countries in 14 weeks, Nathan Drake, eat your heart out. <laughs> uh, uh, I began work as an associate professor in the interactive media and games division, uh, newly renamed to include games uh, in its title, I'm very excited about that, of the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California in LA. Uh, I now teach game design to students from undergrads right up the way up to PhD candidates. And I've also begun work on a series of experimental games as part of a design research project, uh, alongside a very talented graduate student, uh, a guy who's also an indie game developer, my friend Julian Cantor, who you can see here. Um, it's really still a bit too early for me to talk about those experimental games I'm making uh, with Julian, but I look forward to telling you about them, hopefully, uh, later on this year. So it is uh, an incredible honor uh, to be with you guys here this evening. Um, the Glasgow Caledonian Games courses uh, and uh, your faculty and students all have a really great international reputation. I became aware of the program many years ago now. I've, I've uh, lost track of how long. And so it's great to finally uh, be able to come to Glasgow uh, and to, to meet with you all. Um, uh, and like I say, I became aware of uh, GCU and the work you do a few years back, but uh, I think uh, one of the things that really cemented GCU's reputation in my mind was the way that um, you guys host the annual Scottish Game Jam. Uh, you, um, game jams, of course, are such an important part of all of our development lives. These, for the benefit of my parents in the front row, this is a time when people come together for a weekend and make a game in 48 hours. It's something that we could only have dreamt of doing uh, a few years ago. Uh, and that makes GCU uh, a really important focus for the game development community here. So kudos to Romana and everyone who's involved uh, 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 in this effort. Uh, and I was actually very honored uh, when Romana invited me to keynote the, the Scottish Game Jam uh, in 2012. And uh, I'm here um, because of uh, something that is such an honor for me that it's almost overwhelming. Um, uh, the faculty and the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, uh, School of Engineering and Built Environment and the Chancellor of the University are doing me the incredible honor tomorrow of bestowing an honorary doctorate of technology on me. Uh, this was something that I uh, never anticipated in my life uh, would happen. Uh, and uh, I really think that it's thanks to all of the, the hard work uh, and the incredibly uh, high standards of game design craft displayed by everyone at Naughty Dog that I'm lucky enough to be able to receive this honorary degree. Um, it really blows my mind. So uh, thanks to you all, by extension, for the honor that you'll be doing me uh, tomorrow. Um, and thanks to Romana and to Brian and all of the great, and to Doug and all of the great faculty that I've met with today. I've had an amazing uh, whirlwind tour of the program here. It's been really great to see uh, all of the different projects, the uh, student projects and the research projects that are being done here. It's really great stuff. And I look forward in the second part of my talk today to maybe chatting with you about, uh, about some of that. Um, in case you want to follow me on Twitter, in case you're so inclined, there's my Twitter handle. That's my uh, USC email address. I'll bring this up at the end and you can pretty easily find it online as well. Uh, and so what I have planned for today uh, is that, first of all, I'm going to give you uh, a lecture. It's a short lecture, about 40 minutes long, uh, that I uh, wrote and first gave uh, at the Nordic Game Conference just a few weeks ago uh, in Sweden. And like Romana said, it's about my transition from AAA professor to, uh, uh, from AAA developer uh, to a professor of game design. Now, AAA professor, that's quite a concept, but I can see if I can work, uh, work that out. Uh, I'm going to tell you some of the reasons uh, that I made the change. Uh, I'll quickly describe how we teach game design at USC, and I'll tell you why I think that the life of a game designer 
has prepared me uniquely well, not just to be a teacher, but to be a human being wrestling with the life of the mind in the early 21st century. Um, now, you guys should feel free, uh, since we have a little more time than I had at Nordic Game, to put up your hands and ask me questions as we go along. Uh, I'm keen to make uh, this masterclass this evening every bit as interactive as one of my classes at USC would be. Am I right in thinking, guys, that we have until 8 p.m.? Seven, so what, 7.15ish? Oh, perfect. Then, no, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's great. I mean, I actually think that, uh, depending on how many questions you guys ask me as I give my talk, if, I, uh, if you don't ask me many questions, I'll get done at about quarter two. Uh, and then I've got a whole bunch of stuff prepared. Uh, I got, I'll give you a taster, actually, of the lists of stuff uh, that we could talk about. Lists of stuff. That's more sort of naughty dog. Uh, that's more naughty dog. <coughs> oh. And then there's some other stuff right there that we could maybe talk about later on. This comes sort of from my uh, areas of interest in indie games, art games, experimental games, which I taught a class on at USC last semester. I had a lot of fun doing that, and some other subjects. So uh, put your thinking caps on. Um, if you want to make notes as I talk for questions to uh, ask me later, that would be totally cool. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure that we'll have more than enough stuff uh, to get us through. Uh, uh, until we wrap up. And what time do you want to be done and done? And I'll keep an eye on the time. By about 7.20, is that Perfect. good, Judy? So Perfect, it's yes. the time for the wind afterwards. So That's great. Can you can start giving me the big like, wind-up yeah, gesture. You can get off the book. Yeah. 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 Sweet, excellent. Um, so let's do a quick show of hands. Who here is a student of game design and development? Uh, cool, okay, cool. Uh, that looks uh, 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 great. And then who's a, a professor teaching game design, or indeed anything else? Uh, professors, faculty, staff. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Uh, is there anyone here from the game industry? Uh, Scotland's awesome game industry. Wow, that's brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for coming, guys. And how about everyone else, everyone that I didn't mention, uh, who's here out of general interest? Cool, nice one. Well, thanks to you guys for coming too. Uh, that's just uh, interesting for me to start to calibrate my inner professor to see <laughs> where we'll go in the conversation. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's get going with my talk. So I really loved working in the world of console games. Oh, by the way, I, um, I forgot to, well, I already mentioned my mum and dad and my fiancé Nova are here. I thought I had a note to say hello to them. But, uh, if I, like, take them aside to explain stuff to... Um, Mum and Dad, you'll uh, forgive me. <laughs> so I really loved working in the world of console games. Uh, I had an amazing time at every one of the studios I worked at, and the people that I worked alongside really are the model for me of 21st century digital entertainment innovators. I think console game developers are both visionaries and they're pragmatic problem solvers. They're always inventing new ways to entertain, intrigue, and delight us with their video games, while getting the absolute maximum out of the hardware constraints, the engineering constraints that they work within. At the same time, I really love that video games is a pop art form. Uh, video games, I think, won the Our Games Art debate a long, long time ago, and they really did so on their own terms. I think you can see Pac-Man as a work of pop art. And like comics and popular music, Games have made their way into contemporary art galleries and the permanent collections of some very significant art museums simply because they've made their way into all of our hearts without stopping to ask for permission of any kind. And they've now become one of the most popular art forms of the 21st century. Uh, in 2011, the Supreme Court of the United States of America ratified video games a speech protected by the U.S.'s First Amendment, uh, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, giving games the same protection from censorship enjoyed by poets, authors, and every other kind of artist in the world. So I remember very clearly where I was when I realized that I had to make a change of career direction, um, unusually perhaps. It was on the last day of Indiecade in 2010. Um, I first became involved with Indiecade, the International Festival of independent games the previous year uh, when they held their first annual conference in Los Angeles. 
Um, I hope that uh, maybe uh, some of you guys have already been to Indicate. I hope that you'll uh, maybe get to join us in the future. We have a lot of fun there. Now, a year later, I would give a talk at that same conference where I discussed the fact that I came of age in the 1980s at a time when the mechanisms of mass production, uh, in particular the photocopier and the cassette tape, were making possible a big revolution in home-brewed culture. Um, the zines and mixtapes that the era exposed, uh, rather, sorry, the zines and the mixtapes of that era exposed me to ways of thinking about the world that commercial culture wasn't necessarily supplying to me at the time. So since even uh, before I joined the game industry, i had been looking forward to a time when we would have indie games that parallel the kind of indie music and literature that I loved. Um, games that would explore the weird, raw, groundbreaking aesthetic terrain that began to fascinate me as I became an adult. Games that would talk about things that you weren't necessarily supposed to talk about in polite society. So when this new evolutionary phase of the indie game revolution began in the mid-2000s, I immediately recognised the potential that the scene had for driving the world of video games in wonderful new directions, both in terms of reinvigorating the mainstream with new ideas, in just the same way that um, films like Easy Rider and Raging Bull had reinvigorated the mainstream of the movie industry in the 1960s and the early 70s. Uh, and also, I thought that indie games would push games to be ever more artistically rich and would help them to mature as a form. So I was standing in my friend's hotel room on the last day of Indiecade. Um, I was ironing a shirt to go to a friend's wedding that same evening. And I suddenly knew with this like, almost uncanny clarity that even though it was gonna be very hard to leave behind the great honor that I had of working full time at an amazing studio like Naughty Dog, I really had to find a way to both stay connected to this world of console game development that I loved so much while at the same time moving toward the world of indie games and art games, uh, a world that I'd always been in love with even before it had existed. So I've been volunteering at USC, the university where I now work, uh, since 2005, uh, visiting to give talks about the way that games are made at Naughty Dog, uh, and I ended up mentoring quite a few of their graduate students uh, as they worked through their thesis projects. So when an opportunity to join the faculty of the USC Games program came along, thanks to my friend and now boss, Tracy Fullerton, uh, I leapt at the chance to apply for the job. It just seemed like a perfect way for me to align all these interests. So I just finished teaching my first full academic year. Um, I've taught game design, uh, game development, and production uh, to undergrads, grads, PhD students, like I said. Uh, from across the various schools uh, that make up USC Games. Which, if you'll allow me to brag for just a moment, uh, it wasn't me who really did this, uh, <laughs> USC is the most successful video games program in higher education in North America. Uh, and our program has been ranked the number one game school by uh, the Princeton Review, an academic review body, uh, for the past four years. And our students and faculty and staff, many of whom you can see here, are really great. Um, some of them are interested in the mainstream of video game and computer game design. Some align themselves more to indie games. Some love art games. Others are interested in serious games, casual games, mobile games, and other kinds of games and interactive media that probably <coughs> haven't even been invented yet. Um, it's all been a lot of hard work this past year, as I uh, learn how to be an effective university professor after so long in a different field. But I'm absolutely having the time of my life. I'm so glad that I uh, made this change. So, over the years that I've been a game designer, I've heard many people express the opinion that you just can't teach someone how to design a game. Uh, there was this idea floating around that you've either got it or you ain't, you know. Um, now, I think that opinion is silly at best and kind of elitist and exclusionary at worst. But I think that there are several reasons that people might hold an opinion like this. For a start, it is very hard to teach game design, as all of the staff and probably many of the students here realise. Uh, game design as an academic discipline encompasses many, many other disparate disciplines. Uh, I think that systems design, 
and uh, an understanding of human psychology are probably <coughs> two of the most important skills for a game designer to have. But then there's mathematics, formal logic, language studies, graphic design, information design, economics, statistics, and I think that's just for board games. We haven't even got to uh, digital games yet. Uh, once we enter the world of digital games, then there are thousands of other things to study. Programming, of course, is very fundamental. Uh, 2D and 3D art, uh, animation and all of the uh, various arts of the technical director from rigging to shader design. Then there's audio design, uh, visual effects design, um, telemetrics design and usability, all of that kind of stuff that's now crucially important for game designers to think about. I mean, I could go uh, on and on about this. We didn't even get started with potential subject matter for games yet, which would include all of the arts, all of the humanities, social science, the natural sciences, really any subject you can think of. But in fact, this is one of the things that I really love the most as a game designer becoming an academic. Um, as I said earlier, I've always believed that every subject in the world is up for grabs by game designers. You can really make a game about anything, especially anything that you find a system in. Um, and it becomes especially easy to do this if you're interested in everything. I've always been a bit of an info freak, I guess. Uh, and uh, I think that game jams embrace uh, this way of thinking about games, the idea that everything is up for grabs, that there's a game anywhere, there's a system that we can interact with. That's one of the things that makes them so wonderful. But this leads us to our next problem for people trying to teach game design. It's an enormous <coughs> field. It encompasses many, many different kinds of games. Uh, in fact, uh, people continue to argue about what is and isn't a game. Uh, but semantic arguments aside, consider that a game design student could come to you expecting to be taught how to design Uncharted, Angry Birds, chess, and basketball. I mean, they're all games. What concrete core skills can we find that underpin the design of all these different games? What should we start with? And how should we organize all of our different thoughts about all of these different games that we love? Well, just like with anything, you start with the basics, as we'll see in a moment. I've always firmly believed that you can teach game design. Uh, after all, I was taught to be a game designer by guys like uh, Mike Brunton and Jim Bamber, two uh, English game designers. Uh, who were my first industry mentors at Microprose, the first company I worked at. Uh, and, uh, and in turn, I hope that I've helped to teach something to the young game designers I've worked with over the years. Uh, even if it's only been something simple, like how to place a platform game to pick up so that it isn't uh, annoying to collect. And indeed, people all around the world have been working on this problem and have been figuring out very innovative and advanced ways to teach the many different parts of game design for many years now. But let me tell you just a little bit about how we teach game design at USC. So here is Tracy Fullerton, who I mentioned a few moments ago. Um, she's my boss at USC. Uh, she is the chair of the Interactive Media and Games Division uh, at USC's School of Cinematic Arts, um, which is the oldest and largest film school in the United States. It was set up to sort of service Hollywood in the, in the 1920s to provide them you know, with fresh talent who knew not just how to operate cameras, but knew the emerging language vocabulary of film. And the work that's been done at, uh, uh, in the School of Cinematic Arts, I think, has uh, had a big kind of back and forth impact on, uh, on, on filmmaking in the US. Now, Tracy has a long and impressive career, not just as an educator, but as a game designer. Um, she worked at a place called RGA Interactive in New York City in the early 1990s. Uh, where she worked alongside game designers uh, and now professors in NYU's games program, uh, Eric Zimmerman and Frank Lance. Um, and Tracy later went on to found her own game company, Spider Dance, before eventually joining USC to help found the games program that we have today. And she's actually continued designing through her time teaching and organizing at USC. She's worked on a bunch of stuff. Um, she played a really fundamental role in the design of that game company's first game, Cloud. You'll know that game company, of course, for their games Flow, Flower, and Journey, these amazing art games that have been busy changing the world of video games in the last few years. 
Um, Tracy also worked on one of the first ever like first-person art games, uh, Night Journey. It's the one. It's not, it's not a great screenshot of it in uh, in top right. It's a game that only really comes alive when it's uh, when you see it moving and animating. And she made it with the award-winning contemporary video artist Bill Viola. Um, Bill's work uh, kind of came to everyone's notice in the 1980s. He made these very interesting uh, like video art installations. They were a bit like kind of navigable environments that we know from interactive art today. You would wander through these forests of massive screens in an otherwise pitch black room in an, in an art gallery. And Bill and Tracy working together made a kind of video game version that sort of acted as a, a video game gallery of Bill Viola's early black and white work. And Tracy's now working on a game called Walden. Uh, that you can see in the bottom right here. And this is a game based on the life and work of the American writer Henry David Thoreau. Um, and it's partly funded by a grant that Tracy and her team uh, in the Game Innovation Lab have received from the United States National Endowment for the Arts, uh, which is very exciting to me that uh, you know, a big federal body uh, that gives out grants to important major artists is in the US you know, is now giving out grants to a, a video game artist. It's a wonderful piece of progress. So when Tracy first started at USC, she was faced with this formidable task of rising to the challenge we were just discussing, of figuring out how to teach video game design. And the voices that said it couldn't be done were, were pretty innumerable back then, uh, but Tracy didn't believe them either. Um, however, as well as the theoretical challenges of teaching game development that she faced, uh, that we were just talking about, she had this additional practical challenge of working out what tools people could use. Uh, now today we have great easy to use engines like <coughs> Unity 3D and, uh, and UDK, um, along with a host of other great game engines that have a relatively low barrier of entry to non-programmers of course, uh, to get going in, uh, in building their own video games. But in 1999, uh, when Tracy started teaching at USC, the barrier to entry in terms of the, the technical and the programming knowledge required to make even a simple game was much, much higher. Um, Non-programmers could make map models back like then, and that would teach them some valuable game design lessons, especially about you know, level layout. But making an original game was much, much harder for a non-programmer non back then. Really impossible to make something truly original. However, Tracy quickly realized that you didn't have to do any programming at all in order to learn how to design a game. And from my slide here, you can probably guess where this is going. So as well as being a great digital game designer, Tracy's also a very keen board game and card game designer uh, and player. And back at RGA in New York, Tracy, Eric, Frank, and all their friends had developed this method of prototyping digital games using only physical prototypes made with paper and pens and scissors and glue and, uh, and counters and, and, uh, you know, and little toys, smurfs and, uh, uh, and play people and stuff, in order uh, to model the rules and the mechanics and the dynamics of their games in a way that let them make tremendous progress in the early design of their games in this very quick, easy, and very importantly for their company, cost-effective way. So when she set out to teach, Tracy devised a series of exercises based around, first of all, modifying existing games and then creating original board games and card games to sort of draw her students' attention uh, to what we call the formal elements of games. I'm sure everyone involved in games education and people in the industry are, are very familiar with this. You can see a big list of the formal elements of games things that we think are the essential characteristics of all, or maybe nearly all games, uh, right here. Uh, this is the, uh, the list, anyway, that Tracy names in her great book, Game Design Workshop. Um, there are other similar lists that configure things a little differently. So by modifying a relatively simple physical game, people can really start to see what makes a game tick uh, when they don't yet have any experience as a game designer. And they can start to see how changing one rule uh, can impact the dynamics that arise among the players uh, as they cooperate to overcome some common challenge or race to beat each other to the goal. And because it's so quick and easy to change something in a physical game, 
Um, exercises like this let our students get straight to one of the most important aspects of game development, which as many of you will already know, is iterative game design. Of course, as well as designing uh, physical games, our students begin playtesting those games straight away. Like you all know, iter iterative design is one of the core skills of a game developer. No matter how experienced we are, when we build something, we can't be really sure of how well it works until we've tried it out on some players. As soon as we do try out our game on players, we immediately find this long list of unanticipated things that we can improve or fix in our design. And there's really almost no end to the improvements that we can make to our design uh, in this way, by iterating like this. Uh, and I really learned during my time at Naughty Dog that the single best path to excellence in a game is this kind of rigorous, iterative design based on playtesting. Now at USC, we call this the play-centric approach to game development. So even though we now have these great, easy to learn, really easy to use <coughs> digital game creation tools uh, like Unity 3D, we still use these paper prototyping techniques at USC uh, to teach the first years in each of our courses, whether they are undergrads or graduate students, because it really helps introduce them to the basics of game design in a really solid, quick to get to grips with kind of way. Uh, because doing this gives everyone a strong understanding of how the moving parts that make up a great game fit together. Uh, and in fact, these techniques are so powerful that many, many major studios in the US now use them whenever they set out to design a, a new project. I'm actually interested to know from the industry folks in the room, is there anyone here who does paper prototyping before they uh, do digital game work? That's awesome. But perhaps most importantly of all, I think that physical prototyping like this lets us teach our students early on how to go about setting strong player experience goals uh, so that we can be sure as designers that we end up giving players an experience of the kind <coughs> that the designer intends. Uh, now I think even experienced designers often overlook these player experience goals uh, and figuring out how to describe them in the right ways. But they're very important and they can be very varied. Um, they might be anything from teaching a player how to administer their diabetes medicine uh, to something like giving the player uh, a profound emotional experience of loss or something like that. And player experience goals are important because um, we found, I mean, you can iterate all you like. You can try, try, try again. But if you don't have a firm destination in mind, you could end up just going round in circles. And this is a key part of Tracy's design philosophy. Uh, and also, it's a key part of the philosophy of the studio heads at Naughty Dog. Um, we started absolutely every project that I worked on at Naughty Dog um, by writing out like a, a, a brief set of really clear, concise uh, design goals for the project. Uh, and then we, we would keep checking back on them as we proceeded through the development of the game to make sure that we're still heading in the, in the right direction for the design and that we haven't wandered off track. And maybe we can have a discussion later about what those player experience goals might look like. Because of course you don't want to circumscribe the player's experience too much. I mean this is the beauty of games and other kinds of interactive experiences, right? They're these open spaces that players can bring their own stuff to. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to, uh, well, maybe you do want to, that's a bigger philosoph philosophical question, but you do want to describe like a domain of, uh, of possible player experience that is somewhat limited. Um, all games are made up of rules and constraints, and you do need to figure out how to, uh, how to describe them clearly and well. That's something that we're still figuring out how to do, I think. So feel free to ask me questions now or, or later. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. So anyway, you can read um, a lot more about the teaching approaches that Tracy devised and used uh, in her book, uh, Game Design Workshop, as I say. It's actually going to be getting um, a new edition in the spring of 2014. Um, and alongside Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salem's Rules of Play, um, uh, these books are core texts for the way that we teach game design at USC. 
Um, there are many other great books out there that I'm sure you guys are using too. So, I faced a lot of challenges in my 20 years as a game designer. Uh, whether it was learning how to design a good 2D platform game, uh, like the first Gex game, uh, or relearning all of those techniques as we made the transition from 2D to 3D action games, or in figuring out how to make uh, cinematic action more richly interactive with the Uncharted series. One of the things that I've loved most uh, about the game industry is that it's constantly changing and progressing. Uh, it's constantly full of, of new things to learn, uh, new problems to solve, and as a result, it's constantly full of new creative opportunities, new things that you can do with games. Um, I think that when you're open to change, uh, you're in a good position. Uh, when you're not just open to change, but when you're positively excited by it, really then the whole of your life becomes richer. Um, life becomes less frightening uh, and becomes uh, uh, more exciting. And uh, when you're open to change and you like it, I think that that leads you to see possibilities where others might only see problems and obstacles and, and blockages. And so I don't uh, want to say even, I don't want to boast, I don't want to say that I'm naturally like this. Um, I think, I, you know, I'm really still just a, a simple kid from a small rural town. Um, and I'm actually, I'll admit, I'm naturally a little conservative. Um, and I, but I've really pushed myself throughout my life to try and summon up all of my courage uh, and to follow the example of people braver than me in this regard in being open to change, in embracing change. Uh, and I think that that's what's really allowed me to uh, have the courage to pursue my dreams and aspirations in a way that I've been fortunate enough to be able to do. And I don't think I had any greater and more intensive lesson in this way of being uh, than the time that I spent at Naughty Dog. People have often asked me over the course uh, of this last year or so, um, whether it was difficult uh, or jarring, this change, as I moved from the fast-paced and highly competitive world of AAA game development uh, to what some might see as the radically different environment of teaching at a major university. Um, and my answer has always been, well, no. Uh, in fact, uh, I think that in many ways, Nathan Drake uh, and the players who have played as him taught me how to be a teacher. You see, I have this theory that many of the skills that make someone a good game designer are the same skills that make someone a good teacher. You have to bear with me on this. <laughs> um, when you're a video game designer, uh, especially, I think, working in the kinds of uh, character action video games that I've mainly worked on in my career, you spend a lot of your time figuring out how to teach the player how to play your game. I mean, it's not like we read the rules book before we start to play a game of Uncharted, we just jump straight in there and start to experiment. And in a game like this, you've got a lot of information, of course, to convey about the control scheme, uh, about the player character's abilities, uh, and about the world around the player character. And things that we generally think of as simple in a game, uh, like just like running and jumping, are often actually very complicated under the hood, as many of you know. And learning how to control the character so that he runs smoothly and he jumps at the right time can be equally complicated, um, especially if someone's playing a game for the first time, maybe a new kind of game, or a game in a genre that they don't have any experience of. So in the classroom, I try and adopt the same attitude to my students that I have done uh, to my players making games. Um, any given group of students, maybe like the graduate students that I'm going to teach this autumn, have really diverse backgrounds. Um, some of our grad students will be programmers, some of them might be artists, um, some of them have other kinds of backgrounds in the humanities or the, scientific, uh, or the sciences. And I can't make any assumptions about those, uh, those grad students when they enter my class about what they know, so beyond a certain kind of base level of uh, familiarity with computers and some, you know, so, uh, their certain standard of, uh, standard of undergraduate education that they, they have. So I really have to think hard about what concepts to introduce them to, uh, to set them up for the learning experience of the class in the right way. Uh, and I also have to think about how to communicate those concepts really like crystal clear 
just as I would in an Uncharted game. And I've always found that the, really the best way to start to teach something to a player in a video game is to have them learn by doing it. Um, I really, like many of you, I really hate wordy tutorials. I hate going through a, a tutorial level. Um, and, I, uh, and I really hate screens like this with uh, kind of call-outs around the controller. Um, this is the fallback, you know, for many people when we're trying to teach people how to play our game. Um, this wasn't in the game, by the way. We used this in one of our early playtests. <coughs> but instead, uh, I, th I think that one of the best tutorials uh, in any game that I've worked on uh, is the one in Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. Uh, of course, we simply left the player in control of Nathan Drake, dangling from this train car, hanging over the edge of a cliff, uh, and the player's only possible course of action was to move that left analog stick uh, and to start climbing up the train car. So by finding a narrative that logically narrowed down the options uh, in front of the player to something that they could just get their head around, um, really helped our players start to learn. In other words, if you give players or students like a short-term goal that they can immediately start to work towards and then set them up with some straightforward concepts and a simple action that immediately yields results and, importantly, progress towards a goal, then you provided a perfect, maybe almost irresistible entry to the world of your game or the experience of your classroom. So I try to deliberately design my classes to start in the same way as Uncharted 2, uh, except that I do not <laughs> dangle my students off a cliff. <laughs> uh, please to know. So um, what I try to do is to first of all set the stage for them with just a few uh, interesting seeming concepts. Um, Maybe I'll suggest to them that games are art in ways that they haven't thought of before. Uh, I might draw their attention to Fluxus. Uh, this was an art movement from the 1960s that Yoko Ono uh, was involved with. I'm sure many of you know her, uh, her game Play It By Trust. Um, and the Fluxus movement sought to democratize art, um, uh, but they also embraced games and play as worthy of being artworks, which I think is really interesting. Maybe we can talk more about this longer than we think history of games as art. Um, and I might also ask my students to um, do something else they can easily get their heads around. Um, I'll, I might ask them to think about what a game might be like um, if it lacked one of its formal elements. Um, what would a game be like if it didn't have any players, for instance? What would a game without any rules be like? And then I give the class an exercise to do something that immediately gets them making decisions, committing to decisions, very importantly, and acting, usually by creating something. Uh, now, it could be a very simple exercise. It might be to describe an idea that they have for a game. Uh, it could be to choose some elements uh, that they'll use to make a game later on. Uh, the student chose a pack of cards and some, some army guys. Uh, or it might be, very importantly, to make a simple prototype. But this kind of doing, just on its own, really isn't enough, we think, for, for real learning. Tracy recently told me that she thinks that while doing uh, is a good beginning for, for the path towards learning, um, it isn't enough to just go through the motions like this. There's something else that has to happen in order to bring about real growth in a person, um, whether you're a student or the player of a game. And a real opportunity to do this um, comes once your players or your students have got to grips with their first steps in the learning systems that you've designed. Uh, and as a game designer, I learned that while first, in, in, first impressions count for a lot, as in life, um, what the player does next is every bit as important as what they do first. And if anything, you have to do even more to hold the player's attention than you have to do to simply get it in the first place. Now, you guys are probably familiar with Mike Csikszentmihalyi's concept of flow. Uh, it's this optimal state of being uh, that we go into when we're in the zone, when we're exercising our skills with a good degree of mastery. You know, we've got pretty good at the game. But we have to also continue to be sufficiently challenged so that our interest is held. Uh, 
And it's the balance between these two things, between familiarity and challenge, between mastery and, uh, uh, and being pushed to do something that we couldn't do before, that seemingly, almost magically, holds people's <coughs> attention. So I've been discovering that a good way to hold my students' attention is to try and make sure that they are in this flow zone where they understand what I want them to do clearly enough that they can, they feel like they can achieve the goals that I set for them. Uh, and in that way, they can clearly see for themselves that they're making progress. But at the same time, I have to make sure that I continually present them with new challenges that both build on the skills that they've demonstrated that they have uh, and also demand that they learn new skills. Now, uh, as many of you know, this can be very challenging uh, because everyone in the classroom learns different things at different rates. Um, and, um, uh, and you really have to stay on your toes, I think, as a, as a professor at game design. I do a lot of uh, adapting my plans for the class in real time, kind of jumping around in my PowerPoint deck to try and meet the, need, the evolving needs of the class. And in this sense, I think that being a good teacher is a lot like being a good dungeon master, right? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, you fantasy RPG gamers uh, out there. Uh, and just like a good dungeon master, I really think you have to push your party beyond their, their comfort zone. Tracy told me uh, just a few weeks ago um, that she believes that real learning comes when you transfer a skill that you've used uh, in one place to a new and unfamiliar location uh, or application. And, or uh, it happens when you reflect on the ways that you've used or maybe even failed to use your skills. In fact, maybe the most learning comes when you simply get completely stuck and you can't solve the problem. Now in this sense, learning, I think, is often about pain. Uh, it's about that experience of uh, playing a boss level that you haven't been able to beat. Uh, and you hurl yourself at it over and over again. I'm pretty sure this is Wind Waker. Can anyone confirm that for me? Yeah. Uh, and you hurl yourself at that boss over and over again, and you're trying the same strategies, and then you're failing every time. You feel like you're maybe this close, but you just can't beat it. Uh, until you're about to just quit in anger and frustration. <laughs> um, and then you suddenly realize that if you just do something different, you might be able to succeed. Now Tracy says that our job as teachers, and this was a big revelation for me, she says that our job as teachers uh, is to create the potential for that moment of revelation, uh, and thereby indirectly bringing about all of the catharsis, all of the relief, and consequently all of the true learning that follows that experience. We professors, we can't force people to go through an experience like that. Whether we're university professors or game designers, all we can do is to set up the right conditions uh, for success and then kind of cheer people along from the sidelines, uh, encouraging them to persevere until they get there in their own way. And some, it's possible that some people will never get there, but the players, and the students that just keep trying and that push through that barrier of pain and frustration uh, and failure will get there in the end. And that's real learning. Uh, it's painful. Uh, you might wish that you hadn't been through it, uh, but you did it. Now, I, I saw this in action with one of my uh, students this semester, actually. Uh, he'd made this amazing game in just one week, right at the beginning of the semester. But when he made uh, his second game of the semester, he now had twice as long. He had two weeks to work on this uh, second game. And he did that thing that we all know, both as students and as seasoned professionals. He, he had more time, and he, uh, you know, he had two weeks. He, he designed a game. He spent the first week designing a game that would maybe take him like 16 weeks to finish. <laughs> he way overscoped uh, this project. And close to the final deadline, uh, in order for me to not give him an F for the project, uh, he had to really quickly revise his, his plans. And he only just pulled something together in time. And it was really quite traumatic for him. He's a, he's a good guy. Um, and uh, he was doing his best not to mess it up. 
But it was interesting seeing him go through that process of messing it up and having to learn how to scope his project. Because with his third project, he remembered all of the things that had worked best in those first two projects, uh, which were really specifically making prototypes, trying them out on people, and seeing which bits of them worked and what didn't, and then basing his game design on those prototypes, rather than having all these grandiose big ideas that he then ran out of time to implement, and which may not have been that good at the end of the day uh, anyway. And the game that he made as a result of this prototyping, playtesting, uh, and then kind of designing on the fly, finding elegant ways to fit the working pieces uh, together, um, led him to make this amazing project uh, at the end of the semester. Uh, uh, and in fact, his project was one of the best games that any of my students has ever made. That was really satisfying. Uh, it was particularly gratifying to me um, because learning that same lesson was one of the ways that I think that I personally leveled up as a game designer working at Naughty Dog. Um, I learned a tremendous amount there about how to design and produce video games in the right way from all of the seasoned professionals uh, at Naughty Dog. Um, and while I was at the studio, I was lucky enough to give a number of talks like this about the studio's unique production processes. And in the course of preparing those talks, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to Naughty Dog's studio heads. You can see them here, um, Christoph Balestra and Evan Wells. Christoph uh, is kind of the, the, sort of, he's like a bit like the CTO of Naughty Dog. He has a programming background. He actually comes from the French demo scene. I'm sure many of you guys know what the demo scene is, you know, these very compact audio, visual, self-unarchiving demos. Um, whereas Evan Wells is a game designer that I worked with uh, back at Crystal Dynamics. Um, uh, Evan was actually still in college when I first met him, and he rose up through the ranks at Naughty Dog to become uh, the co-president. And Evan takes care more of the game design and the art side of things. And I also learned a lot from someone you might recognize in top right, Mark Cerny. Mark was one of the people who helped unveil the PlayStation 4. Uh, Mark's a consultant that works, uh, uh, I believe, exclusively with Sony. Uh, and he's been very involved in uh, uh, preparing all of their next-gen stuff. So, really, from Evan, um, uh, Christoph, and Mark, I uh, learned uh, about this approach to making games that was at one time considered very radical, until people began to see, really, through seeing the outcome, seeing games like uh, Crash Bandicoot, and Jack and Daxter, and Uncharted, uh, just how well their radical approach worked. And the things that I learned from these guys have really become um, the foundation of what I teach at USC. So I tell my students about the importance of pre-production uh, and the risk that they run if they skip over this critically important explorative prototyping phase of game development. I talked to them about this uh, thing called a game macro. It's a, a lightweight, adaptable game design document that Mark and Naughty Dog use instead of a big, thick game design document, uh, thereby saving themselves loads of time and money in the process, um, uh, as well as helping make sure that the project stays on schedule. I talk about uh, a thing that I call concentric design, um, and how important this is to make sure that the core parts of your game are really solid before you move on to the kind of secondary and tertiary things that will flesh out your game. Um, I talk about uh, the importance of good scoping, like I said, uh, and these carefully staged phases of alpha, beta, and gold master, which are so crucial if we're going to have sufficient time for all of the polish that needs to go into making a video game really great. And uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, uh, this is something that I uh, tell my students about over and over again. Something that I think we're only really, as a game development community, beginning to get our heads around. Certainly something that evolved over the course of the development of the three Uncharted games. We realized that the sooner we stopped basically adding new stuff into the game, uh, and the sooner we started polishing what was in there, the more brilliant the final thing would be. Um, to the point where, for Uncharted 3, uh, we actually had a, a post-production period on the game, uh, where we gave ourselves time to 
polish the audio uh, and the visual effects in a way that helped make sure that the frame rate was consistent and that the game was really singing as an experience. But one of the most important things I think that I bring to each class that I teach, I learned from my friend Amy Hennig. Uh, Amy is a creative director at Naughty Dog. Uh, and she's a game designer that I've worked with for 13 of the past 14 years now. Um, we both joined Crystal Dynamics in the mid-1990s. And she's played a critically important role in the creation of the Uncharted series. Um, she was the game director of the first game in the series, and she heads up the story and the performance capture part uh, of the production, uh, as well as being the head writer. Uh, very, very many of the lines of dialogue that you hear in the game come out of Amy's word processor. And it was from Amy that I learned the importance of a subject that you might be surprised to hear me mention, um, the subject of vulnerability. I think vulnerability is very important as a game designer, as a storyteller, uh, and ultimately as a teacher. Now, let me explain a bit. You see, Amy said many times that if we made Nathan Drake um, just another square-jawed hero, like all the rest, who kind of wise-cracked his way through adventures uh, without ever showing any real depth of feeling, then we don't think that the Uncharted series would have been the big success that it's been. Uh, it's the vulnerability that we see in Nathan Drake. Any time that he feels uncertain uh, or scared or even something like embarrassment, um, that's what makes us really feel for not the explosions, not the fine-tuned control of him running around. And it's that feeling is what really takes us along for the ride of Nathan Drake's journey. Now, <coughs> fundamentally, the classes that I teach are art classes. Uh, they're project classes where we're making work. And as such, they really have to be safe spaces where students can feel free to experiment, and very importantly, they can feel, feel free to fail uh, until they eventually succeed in the way that we were just discussing. I think this is something that we very rarely discuss as game developers, um, but uh, a lot of us feel like great anxiety during the design process. And students in the classroom often have uh, the same experience. You can very often see it in their faces. We feel performance anxiety when we have to speak up in front of others. I'm always a little nervous, even now. Palms are a bit sweaty. Uh, and we feel anxiety about our ability as game designers when players really hate our game in, in a playtest. Uh, that's completely natural. It can be really good. God, if you'd seen us coming out of some of the early Uncharted playtests, you'd have really seen it writ large in our faces. But in order to get better as game designers, uh, it's really important that we get past all of that anxiety, right? so that we can show our games to other people and then get the feedback on them that will allow, allow us to iterate on them until they're really, really great. So I've always hoped that I could do something in the workplace and in the classroom to help create an atmosphere that minimizes this anxiety that people feel uh, and that helps to give people the confidence to really become authentically present. Like, honestly presenting their ideas and feelings in a way that helps make us better, more interesting, uh, uh, that ha sorry, that helps us to make better, more interesting, ultimately more richly emotional work. So one simple and practical thing that I do to make this happen in my classes is that I keep them closed. Um, I don't permit people to come into the class to, to visit uh, unless it's a planned thing, like a guest lecturer or someone giving feedback on the projects. Um, and in that way, like a bond of trust slowly grows between the individual students in the class as they get to know one another as a group. And it was very interesting to see the way that they would, in, in the autumn semester and in the spring semester, the way that these classes would slowly warm up to one another, um, becoming more and more confident uh, of saying what they really think. Uh, in class. And uh, I also, in class, I try and model good behaviours. This is really something that I learned from um, Evelyn Christoph at Naughty Dog. I try and be respectful and supportive um, with the students. Um, uh, and, I, and I do this by staying very focused on the game in front of us, 
whenever we're giving notes. And this is something I explicitly learned from, uh, from Evan Wells. He drew my attention to the fact that I think something that many of us do quite naturally, but when you stay focused on the facts of the game in front of you, on the screen, and coming out of the speakers, uh, you can kind of be as blunt as you like, as long as you never ever allow that criticism to extend to the person who made the work. So you would never ever say something like, God, what you did was terrible here. You would say, well, this just, this, this shooting, um, uh, you know, the, the, the auto-aiming here just really sucks. But you never say, you suck. And so by staying very, very focused on the work like that, you can, uh, as you build bonds of trust over time, as you stay away from these bad behaviors, um, it really frees you to focus on the concrete ideas that lead you to improve the game. And I think all of this demands a lot of vulnerability, uh, not just from the students, but from me as well. So I recently uh, started to read the works of the American author, uh, social activist, and educator, Bell Hooks, who you can see here. And she says that a class that is also a creative environment, like mine are, can become one-sided. Um, it can even become quite oppressive if the instructor doesn't enter the class with the same degree of vulnerability as the students, who of course are expected to expose their innermost thoughts and feelings to scrutiny by the class in the form of their work. So I try to not just tell my students how they can make their games more fun or how to fix practical problems, uh, or how to make them more interesting or systemically rich, <coughs> and really try to tell them in detail how their games make me feel. I tell them how their work lands with me, whether it's affecting me in positive or negative ways, whether it's making me happy or sad, or delighted or repulsed or anxious. Um, and it can often be a little scary for me to put myself out there like this, uh, saying truthfully how I feel in front of groups of people whose opinion I really care about, um, it really is a skill I've had to cultivate in myself over the years in the game industry. And now that I'm involved in critiques of what are essentially experimental artworks, uh, I'm having to push myself to really take that skill to a new level. And there's a big risk of exposure, right, when you don't know how people are going to respond to you saying how you truly feel. But I found that when I do this in the classroom, my students kind of pick up on my example um, that, er, that I have the feeling that everyone in the room is the same, on the same level, and that we're all worthy of the same respect. And they know, uh, as one of my students really pleased me by saying uh, recently, um, they don't have to be defensive about their ideas, but they are obligated to share and discuss them. <coughs> So I'm really happy to say that in this experimental game design class that I taught just recently, um, my students followed this lead I was trying to set to an amazing degree. Uh, and the work that they created showed very great creativity, uh, inventiveness, and innovation. Uh, and also a really rigorous sense of game design craft in this way of, of trying and trying, making something bad, not being too scared that the, about the fact that it's bad and showing it to someone and, and getting feedback about it. And also, these projects that they made showed a really wide range of emotion. Now, all of that is very important to me, uh, as I mentioned at the start of this talk. Uh, in video games, just as in other art forms, uh, in games and other art, it's the experimental and the avant-garde that often shows the way for the form as a whole. I've spoken in public a number of times about the impact that Tale of Tales game, The Graveyard, had on me, uh, and the way that it helped me to design the uh, experiential, peaceful village sequence in Uncharted 2 that you might be familiar with. And of course, we don't need to look any further for proof of the great impact that experimentalism in indie games and art games can have on the mainstream uh, of the games industry than the incredible success of that wonderful video game artwork, Journey, uh, by that game company who we mentioned earlier. Um, a studio founded by alumni of the USC Games Program, of course, uh, who swept the board, uh, both at the DICE Awards, the major industry awards, uh, and at the Game Developers' Choice Awards this year. 
Uh, I mean, the received wisdom of many people in the mainstream of the games industry is that a game like Journey, with an unconventional protagonist, uh, and without any overt conflict, uh, would be doomed to failure in the marketplace. Uh, and the vision of the people who made Journey, uh, and the industry executives at Sony who supported their vision, coupled with the enormous critical and commercial success of this game, showed us this year that these kinds of restrictive ideas about what a financially successful game looks like are simply not true. It also showed us something else, I think. That if we remain dedicated and persistent in exploring our dreams with prototypes and plans that we've made, and if we let the successful parts of our designs lead us to where they want to take us, and if we're really doggedly persistent in trying and trying and trying again until we push through uh, all that pain and frustration and learn new ways to create new kinds of player experiences, then we can extend the emotional range of video games beyond the traditional kinds of fun that we usually think of and into the realm of full and mature adult <coughs> emotional experience. And in doing so, really continue to cement video games as the preeminent art form of the 21st century. And that was the end of my talk. <laughs> sort of picking up on what I thought you might be interested in uh, there, uh, extra little discussion, so it's taken up the time pretty well. Um, do we have time for some Q&A? Yes, absolutely, that's what we've opened for to, was questions that I'm sure a lot of you have. Well, before we do that, hold your hands for just one, put your hands down for just one second. I need to credit uh, my friend Eric Zimmerman. This is something that I completely failed to do at Nordic Game. My tagline there about games being the preeminent art form of the 21st century, something that I truly believe uh, I owe to Eric, who, who coined that idea, and uh, whose bandwagon I've been freely uh, jumping on uh, <laughs> ever since. And I also wanted, maybe I'll leave this up there. This is a great quote from the game designer Chris Crawford, you know, known for his games like Balance of Power in the 80s. Uh, he saw a lot of this stuff coming before anyone else. And he also has this wonderful quote that I think sort of is a, quite a nice end cap for this set of thoughts that we're in a good position as people trying to teach game design because in a major way, fun is one of the primary emotional responses that we have when we learn something new and then apply it in, uh, in new ways. Do you want to moderate, Romana, or how do you want to do this? I could open the floor to questions. Um, Dave, I'm going to come back to you because I know you'll have plenty. Um, so, anyone have any questions uh, for Richard to begin with? Oh, plenty. Um, so, I, yeah, uh, I was wondering, you're talking earlier about um, the yeah, using paper, paper, uh, paper ghost types, which is quite yes. kind of thing. Um, but I was wondering, from the point of view of the game, I mean, that makes a lot of sense if you're in. Tactical game or mm -hmm. a strategy game or something. Mm -hmm. um, how would you extend that to something like a, like an action game where a lot of it is in like the, the basic feel of the tropes, of the, the basics of gameplay? It's yep. really from the bird eye based on how it feels to play. Um, that that whole kind of game feel thing. Are you familiar with that book, Game Feel, by Steve? No, Swift? but. Uh, it's a really great book and it, it gets straight at what you're describing, which is this core thing about video games that I agree is very hard, maybe impossible, to paper prototype. It is something about like the, um, the accelerations and velocities involved when a character action video game character comes up to walking speed or stuff to do with you know, cursor uh, or, or auto-aim, um, reticule auto-aim in, in a shooting mm -hmm. game. Um, I agree with you that I think that uh, paper prototyping isn't as uh, um, uh, useful in that in that scenario. Oh, okay. I think I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that I think it was. I was just wondering if you had uh, any 
so if you come up with any answers to that. Um, I mean, and, and I have to admit that we didn't do a ton of that kind of stuff at, uh, at, at paper prototyping of those kinds of mechanics at Naughty Dog. Where I think it's more useful is when you start to think about um, sequences of action. Mm -hmm. I think that you could uh, paper prototype that kind of stuff. Stuff to do with resource economies, you can kind of paper prototype by making simple uh, strategy games. Um, uh, and one other aspect that I don't mention in this talk, but that I have always done as a game designer, that I think is kind of related to this, is that um, drawing and sketching and making graphs and diagrams and things, is, it's in Tracy's book, she recommends that you do this as a way of kind of working out ideas. I think as soon as you concretize ideas in the world somewhere, even on a piece of paper with an ink pen, then you start to learn things about what you're trying to do. Um, and that's certainly something that we did a lot of, you know, drawing sketches in our notebooks or diagrams on whiteboards, stuff to do with uh, uh, auto-aim, you know, aiming adhesion and stuff like that. This very kind of arcane stuff to do with programming and maths and, you know, that, that is really at the core of what makes a game great or not. Okay. It's a good question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and I have testified to, to sketches helping us at work as well. We do, right. we do a lot of that too, so definitely. Yeah. Anyway, so? Yeah, um, I've got a few questions. I'll just stick to the one, but uh, give them to me one at a time. <laughs> so basically, um, I'm really interested in games for health. I see an enormous scope for this, especially with interactive movement technologies in terms of sensors and so on. And there's quite a bit of that kind of stuff being done at USC. My colleague Marietta Gotsis works in this area. Yeah, it's Excellent. great. Yeah, that was one of the questions really was whether it's really taking off in the states and, and so on. I mean, I've found out recently that up to up to 90% of illnesses are potentially preventable. It's, it's between 75 and 90%. So yeah. obviously the scope for change is enormous. And um, what it leads me to is one of the reasons I got into that was, um, I'm getting into that, is because I think it's to do with uh, raising awareness of things going on in the world. I've, I've always been quite aware of kind of potentially quite big problems in the world, perhaps through, through my family and so on, that are interested in overseas development. Uh, yeah, yeah. Immediate things like the environment and climate change. Mm -hmm. What do you think the scope is for um, not just gaming but technology in terms of the population potentially at large being able to make a, a realistic impact on things like climate change? Which I think is obviously a, a huge question. But well, the, the philosopher in me gets incredibly excited about this. Uh, it's interesting, one of my friends from college, my friend Lewis Griffin, who now works in computer vision um, at, uh, um, he's at, uh, uh, he's at one of the universities in London, I won't embarrass myself uh, by getting it wrong. He, back in the day, like maybe 15 years ago, suggested to me, what if we could take all of that amazing brain power that people are exercising when they play a game like StarCraft and somehow harness it to problem solving ends. Wouldn't that be amazing? Uh, and uh, I think that probably many people were having the same idea all around the world at the same time because now we have a serious games movement where you know, we can imagine that the, this affinity that people have for games, which are of course like, probably games and storytelling are the old, beyond tools, games and storytelling are the oldest aspects of human culture in existence. <laughs> we recently unearthed some, some bones that are probably die that date back to 14,000 BC. Uh, and uh, you know, we can imagine from the way that primates and tiger cubs play that we've been playing for longer than we've been human. So there's something really fundamental about, about games for us. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I am very uh, excited about it. I think that if uh, um, just in the way that you can imagine uh, that um, television fundamentally put an end to the Vietnam War. Because when people could see on TV terrible things that were happening in Vietnam, um, then uh, people began to rise up and speak out against that war, uh, which caused it to be brought to a close. I wouldn't like to say what kinds of things games could do, but we could imagine a game that was fun to play and that had some positive impact in the world that just kind of spread virally through the world's population and that maybe got us to uh, switch the lights off a little bit earlier and save some energy, got us to pressure our governments to really act on reducing their carbon emissions, something like that. Uh, and I'm uh, actually involved with the Games for Change Festival 
that takes place each summer. It's uh, located in New York. Um, there's also a, a festival coming up in Paris for the first time this, this summer. Um, if you Google Games for Change, you'll go straight to their website. And they are sort of they they act as a, a place where people involved in all these different kinds of games come together um, uh, and uh, present their work to, to to each other. So yeah, I'm very excited about it. Good question. Thanks. Yeah, I think the games will help companies just take place as well in Boston, so that's another good one to to uh, yes. really interesting stuff there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Next question, uh, gentlemen in the back. Hi, Richard. Thanks for that. It's great. Sure. Thank you. Uh, just drawing on your experience with games design, how have you uh, integrated that into your own structures? Have you gamified it? <laughs> That's a very good question. For those of you who might not be familiar with this hot button uh, word of, of gamification, a few years ago, uh, the game designer and game professor Jesse Shell gave a talk at the DICE conference. He was actually on next <laughs> after me uh, when I spoke at that same conference, and he gave this amazing talk. Uh, kind of about the same subject matter. His starting place was, what if we could use games to do this or to do that? And he started off with the kind of positivistic stuff <coughs> I was just discussing. But then in the second half of his talk, he went to quite a dark place. What if, what if corpora big corporations or oppressive governments could use game mechanics to um, get people to do things that weren't in their best interest or in the best interest of the world. And so gamification has become this kind of divisive subject uh, uh, in, the, in the kind of game design circles that I, uh, that I move in. Um, so um, the game designer Stone Le Grand has a sequence of exercises, um, game making exercises that he devised uh, to teach game designers how to make games. They're exercises where you make games and thereby learn how to make games better. Um, and I'm keen to use those uh, in the future. Eric Zimmerman uses them in his classes, I know, at uh, NYU. Um, beyond that, of course, like any uh, uh, game design, uh, any university curriculum, um, our course is constantly uh, evolving. Um, and uh, I guess that uh, I nearly played a game with you guys in here uh, this evening, but it wasn't the, the right thing to do. Um, we play a lot of games in class, of course. We play the, the games that we're making. But I've yet to actually formally devise a game where kind of the students get points and compete with each other. I think I'm like this far away from uh, doing it. So uh, thanks for the question. You've probably uh, set up a whole lot of trouble for my students in the future. Uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'll let the gentleman know. Hi, uh, you mentioned virtual reality at the start. Uh, I was wondering if you tried any headsets and what you think about it. Is it going to change everything? Well, this is a very great and interesting question. Um, I have an, an Oculus VR headset at my mum and dad's house. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been learning Unity recently. And so as soon as I got the Oculus VR, I converted one of my projects to work with it. And it's pretty amazing. Um, I don't, has anyone here had an Oculus on yet? Yeah. Yep. I know that many of you will have had other kinds of virtual reality uh, uh, equipment on. I was uh, down in Professor Vasilis's lab uh, earlier this evening, uh, you know, uh, using just a, a big screen with uh, stereoscopic shutter specs, and that too is very immersive. I've always been kind of a stereoscopy buff. Uh, you know, I still I went to see Jaws 3D when I was a teenager, uh, and, uh, and Captain Io at Disneyland. And I do think there's lots of great and interesting work uh, to be done uh, yeah, here. I mean, I was just blown away. You know, I, I played my game that I'd made. It was a kind of, uh, um, a, uh, you know, an FPS with no F in it. Sort of walk around and look at things, mini art game that I, that I put together. And, and I, you know, I, I thought it was okay on a screen like this. But as soon as I was, like, inside this world, um, and the game was sort of about monumental architecture, you know, it was about being a tiny person in a huge, huge landscape. As soon as I could kind of look up like this, at the buildings that I'd built, everything was, was different. So it's really interesting stuff. There's a lot to figure out there, you know, um, uh, in terms of oh, just all of the technologies around it. But uh, yeah, I think it's here to stay and it's exciting that it's finally sort of affordable to regular consumers like us. So yeah, thanks, good question. <laughs> uh, I think one of the interesting things for me is, you know, I've been a, a professor, I worked at a lot of automotive engineering, 
Right. And right. one of the, the key things, of course, is that as you, as you grow technology, you can do a bit more and more with it. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever been in a car simulator, uh, if you are competent driving, the first thing you find out is it's a completely different experience. Because you don't have all the sensory experience that you do yeah. in a real car. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, as a games developer, what technologies and what sensory experiences would you like to see come up over the horizon that would make an extra step? Well, I, I have a few for you, actually, because I've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, and um, uh, when um, mum and dad were recently in Los Angeles, we went on this uh, motion platform ride, you know, one of those things that sort of moves up and down, angles you around, and it simulated a space shuttle flight, sort of a, a launch and then a, then, then a re-entry. Uh, so I think that that's kind of checked off the list. I think motion platforms are really good. In terms of like the feel of the driving, well that's something for the uh, talented folks who are setting up all of that to uh, problem solve around until it, until it feels just right. Um, we have good vi visuals right now as we were just discussing, we have pretty great audio. Um, but what are the other sensory modalities that we have? Well, the inner ear is one interesting one, um, something that even a motion platform can't necessarily fool, so we've got some, some work to do there. I think um, uh, one piece of really low-hanging fruit that some environment designers do actually use is, of course, the sense of smell, and, and by association, taste, if you were going to, I don't know, some kind of food game. It's really weird. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that seems like something we could do. Back in the day at E3, the big trade conference uh, takes place in Los Angeles, they would have this thing called the Kentia Hall, and it was a smaller hall where you could go and see all of the weird new technologies that were like five to ten years out, and there were all of these smell -o vision boxes that you could plug into your <laughs> PC that were meant to, you know, let you smell the burning rubber of the tires of the car or what have you. Um, and I'm anticipating we'll see a leap forward in a consumer-ready version of that technology at some point. We know how uh, deeply our sense of smell is enmeshed uh, into our whole cognitive framework in some fundamental ways. Uh, you know, the, the um, uh, famous thing about smells activating childhood memories. It's the whole Swan's Way thing. Um, but then I, I recently, for a talk that I was doing, there were all of these other weird sensory modalities uh, that you never hear about. That we have many more than five senses. There's uh, proprioception, our sense of where our body is in relationship to itself. I think as we get further and further into developing the kinds of um, uh, innovative interfaces that we were discussing uh, uh, earlier today, um, then uh, we'll, we'll start to see good stuff, good full body stuff, and of course Connect has been a great uh, gateway towards that. Um, but then all these other weird things, stuff to do with touch and texture, um, even, uh, and this is a bit of a risky one to mention, our sense of how full our bladders is, uh, is something that I suppose might be up for grabs by uh, game developers one day. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's a great question, Doug. I think that that's, there's lots of food for philosophical thought for game designers there for the future. Like, you want to extend into the games workshop thing? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think we'll take one more question. Um, I will go to that gentleman over there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was sort of wondering, as a games designer, what's your sort of view on realism in video games, especially these days with realistic shit as being very popular, but of course, no peripheral vision. So mm -hmm. if you're a soldier and you have no peripheral vision, you're going to get killed. Yeah, so yeah. what would, like, what's your interpretation of to what extent, I suppose, would you add realism into a game at the sacrifice of fun and vice versa? Ah, I see, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good focus, I mean, that's a, it's potentially a very big question, one we could talk about for hours tonight. Um, I think that the way that you focused your question at the end there by considering the, um, uh, you know, the gap that there is <coughs> between realism either in the representation of the world or in terms of the mechanics of doing something like um, you know, running around the field hiding from people, versus uh, what uh, makes uh, uh, the game really fun is, is a good, good focusing question. I mean, as a game designer, rather than a simulation designer, I guess that my default would normally be towards fun. Uh, and indeed, you know, that's the approach that, that most games take. 
Um, but I think that as with any design uh, challenge, the importance is to consider what you, uh, what your goal is, you know, what your player experience goals are, to use the um, terminology that we used uh, earlier. Um, this morning we were um, in the Kelvin Grove uh, Gallery of Art, uh, and in the design section there, they have an interesting suit, um, which is, uh, and the automotive engineers among you probably know about this, the a suit that is designed to, to let young designers um, feel how it feels to have stiff joints, and so how it might feel for an older person to get into and out of uh, a car. And so if uh, you're making a game that has a specific goal like that, then you might move towards realism. Um, it's certainly something that we had to deal with in the creation of the Uncharted games. You know, they're games that on one level, they kind of look like they are maybe photorealistic. And definitely the way that we slave over the lighting models and the uh, patterns of sunlight kind of dappling through leaves from a, from a tree has a lot to do with modeling the physical universe around you. At the same time, the design of the characters uh, is not strictly realistic. All the characters are stylized in subtle ways um, that move them ever so slightly towards cartooniness. And that's one of the ways that we try and stay out of the uncanny valley, you know, a place where you don't emotionally connect with the characters. That stylization, uh, that lack of realism can work really well in, in your favor. So uh, it's a really good question. Yeah, it shows an interest in stuff that I think is fascinating. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll pick up the conversation uh, later on and stuff. Yeah, nice one, thank you. And uh, on that note, I think we'll bring the Q&A to a close. Um, like I said, there's a section outside, so if you, yeah, I think that's going to probably yeah, say just, a few just words. Like remind you about, but first of all, I think um, all of us should uh, once again thank Richard for what I thought was a superb, superb exposition of uh, the subject of games. Um, I'm going to be very keen, I'm sure others will, to try and get Richard back and talk again. And I have some plans for that and I'll discuss that. <laughs> I know that I will. Yeah. So Richard, thank you very much. Indeed.